So, hello and welcome back, and thank you very much for uh, being here now after two days of complete full input information and uh, probably being quite an, an, of an overstrain now to, to keep with us. Well, I'm sure this panel is going to be very, very interesting in itself. It's, very, it's a very uh, varied panel, and I'm quite excited then to have been asked to, to chair it. Uh, we have Marina Tsarsara. Charlotte CHW and, <laughs> and, and Lauren Shapiro with us and um, they all work very differently and because the works, because their processes are so different and their approaches to work are so different, uh, we thought that it would be great to have them all present one after each other and then see how the works talk to each other and uh, allow us reflect and have questions. So uh, a little change from the program, Marina is going to start mm -hmm. instead of uh, Charlotte and then Charlotte will continue and then Lawrence. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. stage is yours. Thank you very much. So, hello. Hello everybody. Um, I will start my presentation with uh, three videos that form part of my last uh, Arts Council in the Arts Council funded performative project in complete bodies and was presented last January in, in London. The video formed part of the live performance, uh, offering a different understanding of each of the three personal experiences of genetic disease and chronic illness. Uh, in this way, acting as short video portraits, mine included. So I'm starting just with the videos. Okay. Uh, is this one making it bigger? Yeah. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Assembling and reassembling a landscape kind of made of play-doh yet with drawing pens shoved into it. A sudden crevice to stumble into, fall, drop, twist, grasping out for the horizons to hold me safe. Weaving and webbing, incredibly diverse with different functions to connect, to bind the shape of your very skin. It's what's underneath. It shapes us. It's the great organizer. Without this bone would be just bone dust. It connects everything together. It would be like a jar of jam without it. Even without the jar. Soft and gloopy, too stretchy, everything slipping. Under my skin, encasing my body and webbing its way through my insides like spider's webs. Every bit of me encased in it and protected by it, connected by it. Kept in human, in taught human shape by fascia. Yet my fascia is fragile, very fragile. It's my ghost inside.
fills me from the center of my heart, then a turning towards the air. Ethnography on the experience of degenerative illness is the center of the doctorate research that I have undertaken at the University of Roehampton, and specifically kinesthetic visceral connection with the audience through the moving image and biomedical performance. I am now reaching the end of the first year of research. Following Frank's lines, I do not try it as, a, as any kind of expert. I present myself only as a fellow sufferer, trying to make sense of my own illness. My bodily experience of an invisible condition called pal carnitine palmitoid transference 2, or CPT2, has been crucial in the way that I have been experiencing and seeing the world since childhood, and this is a basic part of who I am, but it's not all that I am. CPT2 is a muscular metabolic genetic disease which does not permit certain fats to enter the matrix of the mitochondria and transform into energy. This condition is degenerative and manifests through episodes of intense muscle pain and weakness that gradually leads to temporary paralysis and loss of motor control. 
The episodes can last from a few minutes to several weeks. Only 20 people in the UK are diagnosed with this condition. Treatment for CPT2 is still at an experimental level. To date, this genetic condition has only been researched through medical, scientific perspectives, with no publications or wider cultural awareness of the lived experience of CPT2 metabolic myopathy. However, through my personal experience of CPT2, I am exploring artistic ways of working with and reflecting on those deficient cells that limit not only my physicality, but also my social identity. My ongoing intention is not only to challenge what an incomplete body's identity is traditionally considered to be, less able and passive, but also to inspire and move, both emotionally and physically, the viewer, through the aesthetics of my performative bodies, embodied torments, and through the resilience of my broken narrative. By broken, I refer to the sense of disruption of my life's narrative. Illness has been, and is, a major disruption to my biography, and due to the type of the condition, specifically recurrent disruptions. Disruption, fragmentation, disorder, and uncertainty. As most stories of disruption, mine too is a story of difference. Invisible difference. Almost like having a double identity and a secret life whose manifestation would only be perceived as a reserved character and a busy person, especially when I have always needed a justification for not being able to follow others regarding activities, lifestyle, commitments and habits, rhythms of sleeping, eating, resting and more. According to medical anthropologist Gay Becker, Disruption disorders a person's knowledge and experience of their own body. Once the body is assaulted by a serious illness, one's sense of wholeness, on which a sense of order rides, disintegrates. Then one must reconstitute that sense of wholeness in order to regain a sense of continuity and be able to make sense of his or her life's narrative. Then she goes on to linking the sense of order with the body. She stresses that order begins with the body, meaning that our understanding of ourselves and the world begins with our reliance on the orderly functioning of our bodies. This bodily knowledge informs what we do and say in the course of our daily life. In addition, we carry our histories with us into our present through our bodies. The past is sedimented, sedimented in the body. It is embodied. So in order to examine the full range of the effects of disruption in my life, I start with bodily experience and its expression through embodied moving image and the body in movement. As suffering arises not only from the experience of bodily disruption, but also from the difficulty of articulating that disruption. Articulation through both words and art is a way for me to make meaning of my own body-mind experience. Making meaning of one's life narrative restores continuity. Frankl's man's search for meaning emphasizes that life is not primarily a quest for pleasure, as Freud believed, or a quest for power, as Alfred Adler taught, but a quest for meaning. Suffering in and of itself is meaningless. We give our suffering meaning by the way in which we, we respond to it. And I will add, such as the narrative character and symbolism that we choose to adhere to our experience and communicate with time. Although Susan Sontag critiques illness metaphor as something that restricts individuals within cultural stereotypes, by symbolism, I refer to a precise portrayal of an illness experience towards an art that mediates disruption by acting as a bridge between the past and the future. 
Metaphor lies at the, in the intersection of what has been and what can be, representing transformation, converting this liminal space between past and present, the pause between in-breath and out-breath to a fertile chaos, a storehouse of possibilities as Susan Broadhurst describes it. Chaos offers the possibility to be creative with the mending of disruption, inventive with the possible ways of weaving it into the fabric of life and putting experience into perspective, such as rethinking what is meaningful in life. In the videos that we watched, the, the use of symbols uh, through the chosen materials, spaces, objects and movement transmit personal, physical and emotional states and render meaning for the maker through their personal sense of beauty, transformation and expression, communication and offer. According to Arthur Frank, this type of narrative falls under what he calls a quest narrative. Quest stories meet suffering head on. They accept illness and seek to use it. Illness is the occasion of a journey that becomes a quest. Quest narratives testify the experiences and personal processes of illness, including physical pain, fear, sadness, hope, thoughts on life and death, the, meaning, the making of meaning and the sharing of wisdom. Frank does this when he writes to his younger self before illness. He tells him, for all you lose, you have an opportunity to gain. Closer relationships, more poignant appreciations, clarified values. You're entitled to mourn what you can no longer be, but do not let this mourning obscure your sense of what you can become. You are embarking on a dangerous opportunity do not curse your fate. Count your possibilities. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marina. Uh, so. open this up first. Um, <clears throat> okay. So um, I'm not really an academic and I'm not really a dancer. <laughs> but <laughs> on, well, not, not in the uh, traditional um, sense of it anyway. Um, it's still opening. Sorry about this. I need to read my notes, okay, so that should be it, okay, oh, oh, it's not connected in, I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> unfortunately, the beginning of my talk has, um, oh, I'm supposed to be, I'm so sorry, I just really actually left this up, I'm supposed to be putting it into this computer, um, Right, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, I suppose my talk takes a different sort of um, perspective, but also of um, an invisible, usually invisible <coughs> illness. Um, but... Um, Right, I actually have a blurb to read at the beginning, which is why I'm... <laughs> okay, so, um, pushing it is not healthy, but it's what I do. I think that's how dance movement started to creep into my creative practice. I wanted to expand. I think that this conference about physical disability... I, sorry, I know that this conference is largely about physical disability, but it is, an in, it is the invisible part of mine that causes the most problems. <coughs> 
I have joint damage in several places and quite often limp if I'm on my feet too much. Um, but as a perfectionist, with an illness that makes me feel half dead with fatigue much of the time, um, I've had to learn not to be. And um, it's the tiredness that I feel worse with. Um, my body is heavier now and my body feels heavy. Expressing myself through movement somehow readdresses the balance and makes me feel lighter and more alive. It also feels like a form of advocacy, of making the invisible visible, as much of a cliché as that is. It is an outlet for my frustration. I can't feel pain while I'm pushing my body, only afterwards. I couldn't move for a few days after performing a durational piece recently, but it was worth it. I'm certainly not a choreographer, and I favour improvisation around a structure to choreograph work. But I'm embarking on the bare bones of a project where I hope to experiment with collaborative choreography with both trained and untrained dancers. But I'll mention some of that later. Um, so, is it? Oh, it's not up properly. Here we go. Play from start. I think that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah, oh, there we go. It's doing it. And um, this is slightly different to my computer. You'll have to bear with me. Okay, so the first, uh, oh, that's not supposed to be the first, oh, sorry. Okay, so we'll start with this one, that's fine, instead. Um, so this was um, a, I, I kind of like to use the term uh, performance installation for my work because there's always 3D components and um, I do, I, I do sculpture as well um, as a separate part of my practice but it comes, I like combining different elements of my art practice in my performance so yeah I like to call it performance installation and um, sometimes elements of the work will be on show before or after I perform in them. Um, this was um, a piece for uh, the London Science Festival and um, the theme was life and death um, uh, which obviously is quite quite a dramatic theme um, but my I chose to interpret it um, from uh, look at the perspective of looking at um, medication its role in um, disability and illness um, I, um, it was essentially through movement a tale um, about, well very much autobiographical, short autobiographical piece about a body that collapses suddenly and dramatically and then tries and fails to resist the lure of uh, pharmacology um, despite the um, repercussions that can involve. Um, to put it simply, side effects. Um, the soundtrack for this piece, which I was going to maybe play a clip of, but I don't think I will because it needs to be heard as a whole and it's quite long. I don't have any film footage from this, unfortunately. I've only got images. But um, I realised when looking at these two pieces I'm looking at in this talk that I often seem to use bedding <laughs> in my work and that's not just because of my ridiculous lack of budget that I usually work on or li little or no budget but um, I think it's uh, a bit of a morbid joke for me really because anyone with an autoimmune disease will know that your bed becomes a really big part of your life. <laughs> um, so uh, there seems to be an irony to me in like uh, dancing around with uh, with my bedding but there you go um, so yeah I mean it's this was quite a straight forward not very abstract piece for me I'd say but um, it's yeah I mean this was like sand that I dyed black and obviously it's a kind of ash like thing and towards the end of the piece I open all the boxes and more and more is falling out but um, people, medication, I did put off a long time taking medication. I probably wouldn't have uh, 
obtain so much joint damage if I'd taken it earlier, but um, I wanted to look into the alternatives, but sadly, as life got busier, um, I had to kind of resort to that. But um, yeah, I mean, medication is prolonging life, uh, not in my case, because it's a chronic illness, it's not a life-threatening illness, but um, it's also, you know, uh, chemicals. So I kind of wanted to make that point in a uh, life and death uh, themed festival. Um, I have to apologise for the quality of some of the images I'm using. I, you know, um, I was discussing this with someone earlier. I need to start working with someone consistently because you can't always guarantee the quality of your documentation otherwise. Um, but this is um, a kind of series I've been working on for just over a year called, um, oh thank you, <laughs> Uh, called Body Wake and um, again that's kind of a bit of a of a <coughs> joke title because it's about I don't know I suppose it's about trying to you know fighting the urge to sort of stay asleep and not bother and sort of just um, but obviously a wake's also a funeral so it's kind of both the both the morning um, of you know what I used to be able to do with my body and um, a sort of celebration of uh, fighting it really. Um, I, the, the first version of it was um, in a sort of office block that was turned into sort of art studios for a short time in Hastings where I live and there's not a big live art scene in Hastings. I'm trying to sort of cultivate one but there is, <laughs> it doesn't really exist at the moment um, and uh, I think people found it suitably weird so that was quite enjoyable but um, <laughs> I do quite like um, to sort of I don't know confuse and provocate people when I can <laughs> um, but um, I suppose this piece really the movement part of it is 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 kind of like I'm I do Buto and somatic practice a bit and uh, I kind of wanted to do an almost like zoomed in version of dance or a zoomed in dance because um, for me I mean uh, the pains always that I feel is always centered in certain places as kind of a dull ache all the, all the time but you get these sort of patches of acute pain and um, I suppose I was I was using my feet and hands because those are the, the both the the two most important parts of your body in some respects, but also the most painful. So this kind of whole thing of pushing it—I mean, I really was trying to push those parts of my body for a very long time, as much as I could, to do uh, different different things. Um, the film component of it was for an exhibition on. Uh, the theme of home. Um, I was looking at uh, the idea of the body as your home, your body as your home. Uh, some people believe in souls, I personally don't, so I think your body is your home and your mind. But um, I was, yeah, it was, it was kind of looking, uh, the soundtrack in that is quite important to the meaning actually, but it was looking at, um, the, you know, if your body doesn't feel like your home anymore, you know, where is your home? Um, and uh, the, fu the, the sort of the culmination of all that was the um, the installation which I did really recently in uh, Salford in a kind of derelict uh, tower block that was organised by the producer's word of warning, and um, it was. If I could have chosen a setting for that work, I would have probably chosen this. I, I thought it was kind of ideal because I'm, I'm kind of into a sort of like rough, derelict, slightly ugly aesthetic and I quite like kind of creating stuff that's not, you know. Um, there was the quote yesterday that I think uh, Luke used about... Um, creating beauty from ruins but I I think I kind of want to 
show the ruins in a more ugly format, really. Um, so um, I also, you know, working in improvisation and durationally really allows people to kind of track the progress or degeneration of your body if they watch it for a long time. I think as I got more tired, my movements became more laboured and um, I find that quite interesting um, way of working. Um, that is if someone will stick for it, stick with it for that long. But the idea of a durational piece for me is that people can like, like come in and out of it rather than I don't expect anyone to watch it the whole time. But um, and I quite like that's another thing I quite like about the performance installation format is that it's not designed to necessarily require someone to sit through 20 minutes or something and um, making work about your body and your illness or disability um, maybe this is my issue and I need to get over it but sometimes I feel a little bit self-indulgent and <laughs> um, so uh, yeah I mean that's that's kind of interesting um, but I've got a short clip of um, the hang on where is it um, it's on the desktop um, how, where's the, press sorry, minimizer, is there a... Press escape. Oh, escape, and then it can come back up again, or... Okay, right. Sorry, I should have actually practiced on this computer first. Um, okay, yeah. So this is some very dodgy <laughs> footage of sort of someone walking into it and viewing it. There should be sound on it. Oh yeah, <laughs> we've gone through that already. There was actually um, two soundtracks in the room, the soundtrack to the film and the soundtrack to the performance element of the piece. Um, but to play that over it now wouldn't work because you kind of had to crouch to listen to the one of them so it was quiet. And this particular soundscape was um, based actually on a, on a beta exercise I did about listening to your inner sound, which sounds very hippie, but it, you kind of eventually hear it if you, it was a long exercise. And um, some of this was stuff that kind of came out in that exercise. Um, there's also two ceramic pieces included in the installation and um, yeah, I mean, a bit of an obvious comparison with sort of fragility and ceramics and um, a kind of degenerative state of health. But uh, one of them was kind of a cast of, a, of an old jumper that shrunk. And it seemed like a good metaphor for me of like the feeling of carrying a dead weight around, which is how I describe <laughs> how I feel a lot of the time. Um, and that's another one. But um, the, the, the kind of jumper weight was eventually, uh, I was trying to pull it in and um, eventually, inevitably, it kind of got more and more destroyed as I was doing that over and over. Um, 
but it, I mean, this piece also has a very kind of like repetitive, cyclical kind of, uh, kind of, um, not po pointless kind of, you know, it doesn't really progress anywhere and that was a kind of deliberate feature of it as well. Um, and again, it's kind of painted, this is painted uh, bedding. Um, but um, I'm interested in destruction as a kind of part of my work or deconstruction as a kind of, I think it's a form of transference really. Um, and um, I don't know, I've, I've found through kind of like more of the kind of sound noise collaboration I do uh, with my partner called Hysteresis that we, yeah, I mean we kind of smash a lot of stuff up but there, but there's also some, I mean we, we work quite site specifically and there's usually some kind of concept as well but we found that people seem to respond quite joyously to things being smashed up and I'm actually working on sort of running a short course at an alternative school I'm setting up in Hastings um, on destruction and live art. Um, I think I've, uh, I think I've um, sort of possibly overrun, I'm not that sure. Have I overrun or? No, no. Um, so I was just gonna uh, briefly where get back to this where are the slides <laughs> um, something else I'm doing as a work in progress um, that I started much like Alessandro and I'm sorry I can't remember your name um, but much like your collaboration we didn't like work together um, in um, physically in the flesh, we actually hadn't met, um, and this was for a show I was curating. Um, we, uh, she kind of does a lot of sound and music video work, and we collect. I wanted to, I wanted to attempt or experiment with a piece that kind of brought together a crossover between two kind of very unlikely um, partners in disability and it was yeah I mean it was it was in obviously it's there was issues with the idea of trying to do it because I can't I can't talk to I can't explain it to uh, the man that I work with so as much as I would have loved his input or his opinion, um, I couldn't get it. But I was basically thinking about perceptions of time and the fact that, you know, as we all know, time is an abstract concept. What is it? You know, it, it doesn't, it kind of doesn't mean anything really, <laughs> apart from um, to the sort of Joe average person maybe who wants structure it might do, but. I don't know, I mean, uh, needing a lot of sleep, having really disrupted sleep patterns, I kind of lose my perspective on time a lot. And I saw a parallel between that and I, I've been figuring out a way to try and teach the man I work with about time. And um, I can't figure, figure it out. He, he's not likely to ever get it. And there's more important things that we can teach him at this point and try and work on with him. So, um, yeah, I, I use Makaton with the man I work with and um, I was trying to incorporate a more physical, exaggerated version of Makaton into the performance. I mean, there's that one there, you can kind of see that I'm signing. These are unfortunately still from a video, so they're not great, but um, she was kind of working on, you know, ideas of time and light and these were kind of raw shacky type patterns and um, so it's it was a work in progress that we're going to develop more but a lot of the kind of I had various objects that I worked with kind of along this sort of like 
sundially time line type thing which um, due to lack of space I wasn't able to kind of extend it right across the room but that that would be the intention um, there's also a timeline uh, in it's probably in British Sign Language as well but I only know Makaton so but there's a timeline in Makaton signing where a lot of things like now then later they all come along the timeline so it was kind of also acting as a barrier for the like over exaggerated physical I mean I I want to show it to people who use Makaton because I'd be curious to see as a you know it's an artistic interpretation of Makaton and I'd be curious to see if they still got any of what I was saying but yeah I don't know what is it is a, a phrase that I've had to we have to set up situations in order to teach the man I work with so that he understands what it is we're trying to teach him and how he can use it and one of his programs is for us to show him things that he we know he doesn't know what they are and for him to tell us that he doesn't know what is it so that was kind of how I was thinking about time and as far as um, as far as my collaborative uh, work with my partner goes um, hysteresis which is kind of a noise sound project um, I wouldn't want to uh, inflict any of it on you but it's kind of bringing together him as more of a musician and I'm more of a live artist or whatever and we're you know trying to push each other to do what the other one does and I think it's a kind of uh, way of figuring out our relationship problems sometimes he doesn't <laughs> he doesn't really get my illness or he doesn't want to get it or he's jealous of it because it takes time away from um, our relationship as a couple and uh, I think we both use it to take out our frustrations on each other um, we also must look like quite an amazingly odd pair because he's six foot ten and I'm sort of a weird, cumbersome, odd dancer. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, we, people, we seem to get invited to do things, but this, these particular images are from um, a, a, a residency alt MFA uh, who were like an alternative MA project in London did. Uh, titled Unlearning, so I think they must have thought we were appropriate for uh, unlearning music and unlearning performance. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of slapstick sometimes, which I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing. As you can see, we're playing with saws in this one, but um, I often use like. Support a kind of I mean in this one I'm tied to a tied to the wall um, but yeah I mean I find that using like supports is kind of helpful and they can be both restrictive and useful so I mean I'm tied up but I found that quite useful because it kind of provides a um, a sort of uh, sorry <laughs> I can't can't articulate myself today. I've made a lot of notes and I just can't read them now. But um, I guess, you know, uh, I, I wanted to, you know, if, if anyone's interested in uh, a project I'm trying to put together, which is, yeah, I kind of want some more traditionally trained dancers and uh, untrained dancers and um, maybe people with it was yeah it was mainly gonna the idea was mainly people with disabilities but maybe some people without disabilities as well um, because I don't really like putting stuff necessarily into context and when I curate I tend to include a lot of work about disability because it's something that interests me and something close to home but um, I would never say like it was an inclusive arts platform necessarily. I would just kind of, uh, it's just an arts platform, a live arts platform. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, the, the project I'm working on would be uh, kind of entirely floor or wall based work, so um, kind of using like uh, transfer transferal of weight and support, and again playing probably with like more ugly kind of forms of movement but yeah it's, it's really I, I just am interested in sort of working with some working with different people and I've not done any work with kind of trained I mean this trained and untrained thing it's more like in my head than anything else I think um, but yeah I'd like to work with people who are kind of choreography you know more experienced in kind of choreography and, and as I said you know most of my work is improvised which I like because it's I guess it's kind of a thrill and it's it means if you're having a really bad day you can do less and if you're having a really good day you can do more so it's always a bit of a potluck as to what <laughs> what you're gonna what you're gonna get on the day and that's you know that fluctuating thing causes problems when you're you know sometimes trying to do something ambitious because you've got to either cancel it or find a last minute sort of solution but um yeah sorry for a bit of a garbled uh presentation but <laughs> i hope it was interesting in some way and i realize this is like the far kind of out of dance more into art or whatever but dance is art too side of it which i was a bit nervous about but thanks for like indulging me anyway <laughs> are going to be brief because I'm much more interested in questions and I'm sure maybe that's a good idea too. Um, the first thing I need to do is to thank Sarah very much for bringing me to Coventry. Thank you very much Sarah uh, because it's a great pleasure to be here and there's also I'd like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts for bringing me here as well. Um, may I stand up just briefly? I'm going to stand up just briefly. Okay. My body ends here. That's where my body ends. So I am an above knee amputee, and I'd like to talk a few things today about being a, an amputee performer. Earlier this week, I gave a presentation called The Role of the Amputee here at Coventry. So for all those who attended, I think they found it interesting. I, I do have a DVD. I didn't bring it with me today, uh, but I'm happy to share it with all of you. So I would just like to start with my statement. That sounds good, doesn't it? That I believe integrated dance is an inquiry into difference. And I believe the disabled body is a tool of that inquiry. And I believe the amputated body is a different tool. Because the amputated body brings with it a completely different aesthetic, a completely different physicality. And in the world of dancing on stage, it brings with it a lot of challenges. Because very few choreographers I've worked with have experience with um, amputees. They have experience with wheelchair users. They don't quite know what to do with the prosthesis. They don't know, quite know how the prosthesis works on a stage production. And one of the things I've tried to get across to people is that this idea of assistive devices, prosthesis, crutches, wheelchair, cane, etc. They all have a functional quality. Excuse me. They have an artistic quality beyond their function. So the prosthesis has a role to play on stage. You don't need to walk with the prosthesis in order for the prosthesis to be functional in an artistic setting. So one show that I did, we had the leg hanging from a nail. And we had a female, able-bodied dancer take the leg off the nail. What do you think she did with it? Okay. She wore the leg around her waist. 
She didn't walk very well with it, but that was the idea. Because I was uh, beside her and I was hopping up and down. So the goal of that vignette, if you want to call it that, was the contrast. First of all, between able-bodied and disabled, but also to place the prosthesis in a role beyond that of a functioning, a functioning role. For me, as an amputee dancer, my goal is to try to find meaning in movement, and try to find movement as something more than functional movement. And for me, as both a disabled dancer and an amputee dancer, I place a great, great significance on stillness. I'd like to say that again. I place a great significance on stillness, because I think stillness has a vast artistic potential in the way that it's used in conjunction with the able-bodied dancer. So uh, vignettes or tableaus, it, I, I find it very meaningful to engage with the audience simply as an image. Because first of all, most people have never rarely seen a one-legged person. And they've certainly never seen a one-legged person dance. And if ever there was such a thing called invisible disability, most people sitting in this room, if they didn't know, they might assume, they just might, that I'm a two-legged person, which I'm not. And yet, that's the social image I'm projecting. That social image is shattered in a performance context. And that's what interests me artistically, uh, particularly when I work, for, work with choreographers. Um, we had a presenter from New Zealand this morning, and I love the word she used. She didn't say disabled body. What did she say? Does anyone? Say it again? Extended. The extended body. I find that such an engaging term, particularly for someone whose body is extended. So my body is, ex there's more to my body than I think there is even. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm able to use my extended body in a way that I can. And of course, I must give a brief moment to my philosophy. I think integrated dance is absolute liberation uh, for disabled people. It's absolutely transformed my life because I'm able to take my body in places it never went before. And it shatters stereotypes of what I'm capable of. Uh, and what I'm not capable of. Just a, a quick few things that I talked about in my presentation. I'll just, just very, very briefly. This idea of hopping, hopping, people have this idea of hopping on one leg, that you're hopping up and down. Uh, in my presentation, what I try to do in the dance work, there is, there's no hopping per se. Your foot, ideally, shouldn't, shouldn't really have to leave the floor that much. The term skating or gliding is, I, I find, very functional. I'm able to uh, use, utilize the stage much better uh, through that prism. Another idea is falling. People have this idea that you just fall to the ground. That's not a very good thing to do because you're going to hurt yourself. The idea for the amputee, I find, is the, the term I use is crumpling, where you sort of bend your knee and the whole body sort of collapses onto the stage in a safe kind of way. And also the other system devices of crutches has a great functional value to me and an artistic value because it creates velocity. Does everyone, this is so critical to know, just a quick physiology thing, there is a huge, huge difference between the above knee amputee and the below knee amputee. I was watching, um, everyone may have seen Prince Harry greet, greet the soldiers who were wounded. They all came to Buckingham Palace. They had all walked on a hike. They were all amputees. They all were below knee. Most of them were. So they all had their thigh which makes walking a whole lot easier. As an above-knee amputee, I am expending 60% more energy than if I was below knee. And that brings to another whole other issue, which is so critical for all disabled performers, which is conserving energy. You have to conserve energy, or you're not going to have any energy to do with. And this was a big problem I had uh, with one choreographer who didn't quite understand all the energy that I had to consume. And I was just so exhausted. So it's also, uh, I guess, the responsibility of the disabled performer to educate the choreographer who may not have that knowledge. Because I'm not using a wheelchair. There's nothing wrong with using a wheelchair. Actually, a wheelchair can be really quite liberating. But in terms of the challenges that I faced, I think the education of the choreographer without experience is, is a very real challenge. And I just wanted to mention one more thing. And I'm happy to take other questions. Earlier today, I saw an extraordinary performance, and I hope all of you saw it, with Caroline Bowditch. Mm -hmm. What's it called? Falling, Falling in Love with Frida. Frida. Falling in Love with Frida. I absolutely adored it. But at the same time, something clicked in my brain about it, which is as follows. 
I believe Caroline sees Frida as emblematic of disability or as an inspirational figure or as a person of difference, and she connects to her. When I hear the word Frida Kahlo, the first word that comes into my mind is amputee, because she lost a leg. But it's interesting to me how these can have a certain elasticity. What Frida represents to Caroline and what Frida represents to me are almost different and the same thing one. Um, so that's the sort of connection that I make to other disabled performers. We may not share the same disability, but we still take our potential uh, from these kind of creative dynamics. And um, that's all I had to say. So this has been, uh, I think, very rich in the different approaches of each of the three artists we have here. We have like three worlds coming together, at least three worlds coming together here in the uh, here in this panel. And um, I, I would like to open uh, the platform for questions. First of all, thank you. Um, thank you all three of you. Um, and I, I was very struck by um, a theme that's been a recurring theme through the last two days, which is about acknowledging um, individual identities and that you know difference, everybody's differences. And, and I think that came through very clearly in each one of you. You know, you're, you're working with very particular kinds of identities, and, uh, and I really enjoyed hearing about that. Um, I was struck by uh, a sort of different narrative, which is one around incompleteness versus extension. You know, so there's a sort of interesting sort of oppositional thing going on there that we talk about. You know, that disability is, 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 is more than, and now we're talking about disability is less than. And that, that's a bit black and white, but it felt as if the, 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 the discourse has shifted a bit. Um, but I was also struck by Maria with, with your project how um, the, the, the disability or the, or the condition was, was made very visible, I mean, it, you know, explained. And I was very struck by how you know, one, that, that is not something that one is, 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 is usually familiar with in, 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 in dance. It's a sort of the conditions you know, written out and, uh, you know, it's not. But, 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 but I do have a question, so I'm getting it, which is, um, um, I, I was interested in why you chose film as a medium, actually, mm -hmm. what was it that you chose? It's a very simple question. Okay. Okay, first of all, uh, regarding the um, incompleteness versus, uh, this is a very interesting, very interesting thing. Uh, I suppose it is because, um, I can see where we come from, but Obviously, um, with my condition, there is something that is missing mm -hmm. in myself. Mm -hmm. And that's why it feels to be like an incompleteness. Although, it's like, obviously, it makes me be able to extend further to the identity that I would have, you know, possibly becoming a professional dancer, doing just that, being in a company, etc., etc. I have to find so many different alternatives to go around dance, which is like what I loved mostly in my life. Um, so, what was the question? Well, <laughs> oh, yeah, the film, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I come from, my background is both in dance and visual art because I was not able to do full-time dance. So my first degree was in at the University of Brighton Dance and Visual Art mm -hmm. as one. And my master's was on screen dance, dance for the camera. Um, and I feel much more free to be able to express myself, you know, and combine um, my ab physical abilities and physical difficulties to say, well, actually, this is something that I know I will be able whatever happens to mm -hmm. um, One is that the second reason is because I'm interested, I, I have been looking in my master's quite a lot the notion of haptics and I'm very, very interested in coming closer to the audience and um, I think film is a very good medium for doing this because you're able to just show things as you see them. And this, is, this can be really powerful. Um, I use film in my performances most of the time. So you can come, you can have the close-ups, you can really like in the way that you imagine it. So this is one, another way. 
Uh, the third way, so the people that I collaborated with, one of them has um, uh, mobility issues, very severe ones. Um, so it was very difficult actually to make kind of only a dance performance and to film seems to be an easier thing to explain things and uh, then to have like some smaller parts of performance coming in. I, um, I, I totally get what you're talking about, about film, and I think it's something that, yeah, and also, of course, you make a performance or dance film, and you can do it on a day when you're feeling real good, and you can get more out of yourself, maybe. Um, and, yeah, it's that close-up thing, and I, like, <clears throat> the body wake piece, I really wanted that to be like a moving sculpture. I wanted people to come up to my body and like come up to the sheet and like see it, but people just don't do that naturally. So sometimes I expect too much from, I think you either have to like, if you want someone to get, the audience to get close to you, unfortunately I think a lot of the time you have to get close to the audience. Or the back. Yeah. 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 Because, um, yeah, people are kind of just... <laughs> so do, do you see there's a difference when you present your work uh, more in the context of dance, of performing arts, or of visual arts? Um, uh, are, are there differences in the, from the side of the curators, of the presenters, uh, who are more open in one realm or in the other one, or, and from the audiences as well? Or do you think that's irrelevant? Um, I haven't really, this is the first time for me really that I've presented in a dance context and I was mm -hmm. freaking out about it, but I thought no, no, like to me what I do is dance and it is dance and it's different and it's, yeah, it's more like maybe more raw or whatever, but it's, I thought no and it's like a valid alternative to bring to this conference, but um, yeah, I think Almost always, I show my work in like multidisciplinary exhibitions, so people use like loads of different media, and mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it's interesting to. I, I think it's good to show work out of context. Like mm -hmm. I didn't like. I don't like really showing work at like performance art events because it's oh, it's difficult. <laughs> I yeah, I struggle with that scene and. Also, I think if you make work thinking that you're going to be able to show it in a certain scene, it can get like too comfortable for the audience or the maker. I don't know, I think you have to just make work and try and show it in loads of contexts and maybe unexpected contexts where it's going to like confuse people or make them want to ask questions or they might not, yeah, I don't know. Would you have reflected movements maybe which you hadn't thought of? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this specific piece was presented in a dance space mm -hmm. um, and in hospitals. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, one was the National Institute for Medical Research and the other one was the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting for them because the doctors came and uh, some of them, many of them know me. <laughs> so they were like, oh, ah, <laughs> this is different. <laughs> now it's like suddenly she's not a patient anymore. She's not kind of a passive person coming here. And, um, so that was interesting for them. And actually I had very interesting comments from my doctor also thinking that it was a very interesting way for her to get to understand more about the disease. Um, because they just read those things in, in the books and then they come, like the patient comes and they just ask, oh, okay, are you in pain? Yes, I'm in pain. This is a very general thing. So it's like, what kind of pain? How can you show the kind of pain? And there are other ways of showing to the doctors what is really wrong with you, how does it feel? Um, so she thought that visual art, like video or photography, is a very good way for them to get a sense of, of the patient. and. Uh, uh, she was very anxious also because I was in in that performance I was dancing a lot so she was like oh my god is she fine and I'm like yeah, <laughs> yeah this is my life you know it's, it's like uh, yeah because it's not usual for for my condition mm -hmm. um, and 
Yeah, otherwise I've done quite a lot of work also outdoors, just mm. in open spaces and stuff. Yeah. For, uh, and for audiences generally, who, who are the audiences who go to your open door places? Well, in those ones, that was really challenging because mm. in those performances it was on purpose. I was choosing areas that they were financially or socially deprived. Okay. So it was really strange, very strange places in the southeast that people would be not oh, even Hastings. wanting to talk to you. Hastings, St. Leonard's, uh, yeah. yeah, around there. That's where I live now. <laughs> yeah, and actually it was very, they were very close, so they were kind of looking, but, you know, not really wanting to engage, but they, wa but they wanted. But and they, they were curious. Yeah, they were curious. That was challenging. challenging. Okay, so the, the, the circumstances, there were other circumstances which were of lack yeah. or of deprivation in the situation which had nothing to do with yeah. uh, conditions of bodies. Yeah. Interesting. And for you, Lawrence, do you, I the <laughs> do, you present, uh, do you present your work normally like in dance, dance environments or? Yes, dance environments, also outdoors places, which can be very challenging mm -hmm. for community, if it's a community dance piece, because 90% of the people will be able bodied. Mm -hmm. So how do I fit into that? And that's when you really require the innovation of a good choreographer. Mm -hmm. So it can be sensitive to the disabled performer. And that's why I'm now much more interested in doing my own kind of show. Which will in a fixed uh, setting, which will focus on life. Yeah, I find galleries more difficult in taking in dance because yeah. when you present it as dance, mm -hmm. they are most of the galleries don't want really to have dance. Mm -hmm. But if you present it as something else, which includes <laughs> movement, then the possible I, I find in my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was I was just going to say actually. Um, I think that struck me about, even though your work is very specific as well, the actual films, you know, they have like a work about disability or illness, I think, can be both specific and like universal. Mm -hmm. And that was something I forgot to mention in my presentation. I think I try to, maybe too hard sometimes, to abstract things a little bit rather than be really like straightforward about them or and that's because I, I want people to like maybe make something else up for themselves but I don't know if that's always successful at all probably not um, but it's yeah I think that it can you know like we all have anxieties about um, you know our bodies failing us and our bodies coming apart or our bodies you know and all an economy of the market, in a way, I thought, how, how big, uh, how important the subject turns when one starts to negotiate the possibility of delivering the same performance or not uh, in, in the moment of the, you're selling your performance. Someone is buying your performance. And solution of the last moment, you know, what, 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 what are the dangers or what are the, the challenges or what are the uh, potentialities of that moment? No, no, well, maybe we need to think of performance in a different way uh, as well, of what is, in, at least in many layers of the meaning of performance. <laughs> what do we have to perform performance in that moment? What do we have to be performative in performing in that very moment? So. That was for me a very... Yeah, but I do agree because you really have to be a very good improviser in life. Yeah. Because this is the yeah. thing what, that you learn through, through all of those kind of limitations and difficulties. It's like life goes on and like many times you cannot get up to the standards of like social standards of where you should be, what you should be able to do every day. Um, so, in a way, you need to improvise, you know, I feel that I need to improvise so much, you know, like, okay, how do I feel today? Can I really do this thing that I had said I need to be doing? And if not, what are the alternatives? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a continuous dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. And as she said, because of the energy. Yeah. <laughs> you can also be very, I find that I can be very hard on myself, like, you know, I, I forget to judge myself, like, Kindly, like it's like you know, oh, I've achieved so little this month, you know. And you know what you were saying about you know, kind of you constantly compromise things like you know social, social things as well. And you know, 
people. Yeah, it's hard for people to understand. So yeah, you have to, like you said, you have to improvise a lot. <laughs> yeah, because of the invisible of uh -huh. the disease. So basically, you are pushed into having to, to be as you look that you are. So because you look healthy, you kind of pushing yourself more because in a way you don't want to be different. You want so to there, be there's an ambiguity there. so there is anyway kind of about the visibilization or not. Exactly. And for me also like it is about legal the legally of I mean the law uh -huh. does not consider my health issue as any kind of disability, you know. Mm -hmm. But I cannot work full time because I don't have the energy to do it. But at the same time I'm one of twenty people. So obviously this is not going to be as important like you know, so it's very difficult to achieve a framework, exactly. a legal framework, which yeah, protects you. Yeah, to be supportive, to be like, there is no yeah. way to do this. So, so that's why you keep pushing yourself, because you are not there, but you are supposed to be able. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, before opening, I had another question, uh, uh, which um, I, I was wondering to which extent, I mean, of course, the, the, the way in which you treat create, um, especially when using your physicalities, your, your bodies, that the different conditions com uh, have a clear influence on the uh, vocabulary which is produced. Mm -hmm. But to which extent is that always, generally, often, seldom or never, uh, the subject or the thing of creation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, well, mm, for me, like, not all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it inherently comes into everything, mm -hmm. I have to say. But I feel pushed sometimes not to always make work that is actually about the experience of a health condition. Um, because, I don't know, some people, I, I, this is something no one's really brought up or discussed, but some people get funny about it, you know, they think that if you're working work about your problems, which I don't see it like that, I see it as a positive thing, I see it as a sharing thing, I see it as a talking point, whatever, but some people will criticise you for that, they say, oh, you're using your health to further your art career, or you're using your health to get funding, or you're using your health. And I find that, you know, really difficult. So I think I force myself to make work also that's not about that, but I, I just think it creeps in. <laughs> oh, of course. So, yeah. Yeah, for me, I think that um, consciously using it as a subject, I started doing it last year. With this project? Uh, with this project, which I have much more material, this is just like mm -hmm. three videos that were part of the performance, but mm -hmm. it has been, actually for the last two years, it started like coming into consciously wanting to get deeper and deeper into this. Um, before that, I was doing work that although there was like a different subject, if I look at it now, um, I can see age as well, and we're all going to go through it at some point. So I think that you know, work on all the work on this theme can like be really universal as well, which I think is something else people have mentioned. Like it's very individual, but also very universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the personal becomes social. Yeah. 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 I am interested in this uh, focus. Uh, on the visual arts, like a mirror, but it is like uh, some object which is not so much neutral, uh, this eye of camera, and I see that the time in performance of these people uh, is very saturated, uh, and uh, even uh, for me, hard to uh, describe this in uh, the terms uh, 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 just aesthetic because for me it is some kind of create, creative dance integrated 
and the donor. For me, these people are like exposing to all the being in cosmos, being in the nature. So they are like listening on body, mm. but it is not for exposing myself uh, in front of some object, not me, but I may identificate with this, but like dissolving and finding on being in everything what is around. Mm. And for these people, it is for their free choice, because it is not verbal, <coughs> not directive, I think. Mm. Yeah. How they will use wire, for example. Yeah. And uh, for, for this, for me, could be interested find out how this pro process of integration of mind and body in these people got an impact on their process of healing mm. uh, of this that uh, they are better adapt to the way how they are living. Mm. Because they sometimes uh, people got sometimes very serious characterological difficulties in their life because of this sickness. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is one of the aims of, of the project is how to find ways to be able to express what, how it feels, you know, in one's body, which is not just body. You know, it's like that's why illness is so complicated. It's like so complex because we are not only bodies, and the body is not just only functional. So one of the aims for me is is to create the methodology to be able to to work with people with invisible diseases to be able to find ways, artistic ways, through movement, through the, the camera. Um, photography to express what is inside and I found this really therapeutic for all of us because it was a process it took us like three months of having a process like uh, where obviously I was the kind of directing the thing you know holding the thing together but at the same time they are professional you know uh, performers so we all went through our own processes in this so, yeah. big expansion. I think expansion has been, expansion of the body has been a, a big subject. And what is visible and what is invisible has yeah. been and the negotiation between the desire to make things visible and the desire of making things invisible, mm -hmm. which is not always that obvious, have accompanied us these two days. Um, thank you very much for being here. If there is nothing, nothing urgent that you want to say, thank you, all three of you. For thank your you.